Hello, St. Mark's. This is the fourth video in a series about English hymns. And this week I'm going to talk about British hymnody from the 16th and 17th centuries. As you've heard me mention several times in this video series, the first collection of English hymns uh, was the ghostly psalms and spiritual songs of Miles Coverdale. It was published in 1535, and these were English translations of German hymns. In the 16th century, Latin sources became more important to Anglicans than the Germanic hymns. And that's because we have our roots in Latin hymns. The Serum use was very important in the, the region of England, and the Mass was in Latin, and it was a variant of what was happening on the continent at this time. So these Latin sources become more important. And in 1545, Thomas Cranmer published a liturgical document called The Primer Set Forth by the King's Majesty and His Clergy to be taught, learned, and read, none other to be used throughout all his dominions. So this document that I'll call the Primer for short replaced the serum use that I mentioned before. One of Cranmer's criticisms of the serum use is that it was just too complicated. You needed a number of books. Depending on the source, it was anywhere from like 15 to 30 books to do this mass. And he just thought it was way too complicated. So over the course of time, Thomas Cranmer worked to revise this and what became our prayer book. This primer included the litany, the great litany that we sing on the first Sunday of Lent each year. It was published in 1544, and vernacular forms of the traditional eight offices were included. So the daily office, this is a great time for a plug. The daily office will be the topic for this week's Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., uh, prayer book and hymnal course, uh, part of my In Liturgy and Song series. So if you're interested in the daily office, please join us on Zoom on Wednesday night. But the original offices that came before what we have in our prayer book today, were there were eight of them. And these offices are traditionally prayed in monasteries, and they are called Matins, Lauds, Prime, Terse, Sext, Known, Vespers, and Compline. Matins is in the middle of the night, Lauds is at daybreak, and then the rest are during the day. Vespers is sometime around uh, sunset, and then Compline is right before bed. Cranmer included in the primer vernacular translations of the traditional hymns sung at these daily offices. And unlike previous translations of these hymns, they were intended to be sung in church rather than as simply devotional purposes at home. The primer translations were metrical and meant to be sung to traditional Latin plain chant melodies. If you want to look back, you can see the plain chant video where I sing a psalm to one of those tones. Though Cranmer's early translations of these office hymns may have been used in church, they were not included in the first book of Common Prayer, which was published in 1549. In 1550, one year after the first book of Common Prayer was published, the first revised ordination rites in English were issued, and they were published in a collection called The Form and Manner of Making and Consecrating of Archbishops, Priests, and Deacons. Check out those old spellings, huh? These ordination services followed the Serum and the Strasbourg rites by including an English version of the Latin hymn Veni Creator Spiritus. Cranmer's English version of this hymn didn't work with the original plain chant melody, which sounds like this. Veni Creator Spiritus Mantas tuorum visita. But because Cranmer's version was in English, it has a different meter, and it doesn't fit that original plain chant melody. 
So a new tone was composed. Come, Holy Ghost, eternal God, proceeding from above, both from the Father and the Son, the God of peace and love. As I mentioned in the first two videos in this series, the bulk of English hymnody at this point is metrical psalms. But these psalters that were published at this time included a few other things, such as the Veni Creator that I just sang for you, such as those office hymns that Thomas Cranmer translated. They also included prayer book canticles, such as the Te Deum, the Song of the Three Children, the Benedictus, the Magnificat, the Nunc Dimittis, and the Athanasian Creed. They also included six hymns. And these six hymns have some interesting titles, so let me read them for you. Number one is The Lamentation of a Sinner. And the hymn text is, O Lord, turn not away thy face. The second hymn is The Prayer Unto the Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Sprite, the God of Might. I love that rhyme. The third is called The Complaint of a Sinner. And the text is, Where Righteousness Doth Say. Number four is called A Lamentation. The text is, O Lord, in thee is all my trust. Number five, The Humble Suit of the Sinner. S-U-T-E, Suit. And the text is, O Lord, of whom I do depend. And number six, a thanksgiving after receiving of the Lord's Supper, with a very interesting spelling. And the text is, The Lord be thanked for his gifts. This sixth hymn, which is a hymn of thanksgiving, is particularly significant because it is the first known Anglican communion hymn. It was written by William Samuel while he was exiled in Germany during the reign of Queen Mary. These six hymns continued to be included in most editions of the old version of the Psalter and were sung regularly alongside metrical psalms and canticles. Over the next century, a small number of hymns were written which were intended for devotional use at home rather than public worship of the church. In church, singing was mostly unaccompanied and in one unison part. Devotional singing in homes, however, was frequently sung in four parts, like we have today, and in fact, they may have been accompanied by a variety of instruments. And one collection published by Richard Allison was laid out in such a way that people could sit on four sides of a table and sing together. And I was even able to find a page from this collection isn't it interesting how it's laid out so that different parts sit at different parts of the table and can read the, the music the correct way? Another interesting thing a friend sent to me a while back is a set of knives that would have been used at a dinner party so that the guests and the hosts could sing grace together. So these knives include the voice part up at the top and then the notes and the text to sing. It's a particularly interesting custom that there are these knives with music on them to put on the table because at this time period, nobility did not cut their own meat. They had servants to do that. Before the English Civil War beginning in 1642, there was an effort to improve and expand congregational singing beyond the old version and its small collection of hymns. One notable example is the Hymns and Songs of the Church, published in London in 1623 by George Wither. This collection was in two parts. The first part contained metrical paraphrases of scripture called canonical hymns. The second part contained spiritual songs, or what we would call a hymn today. There existed at this time period a very, very powerful publishing house 
called the Stationers Company. And this company owned the license to print the old version of the Psalter. And instead of going to them to have his hymns appended to the old version, he went directly to King James I. Yes, that King James, the one responsible for the Bible translation. And Wither asked for a royal patent to be able to print his own hymnal. Not only did King James I grant the patent, but he decreed that all editions of the Sternhold and Hopkins Psalter, the old version, must include Wither's hymns and songs as a supplement. The Stationers Company, of course, refused to publish Wither's hymns with their Psalter. And bookbinders, because they were being paid by this extremely wealthy publisher, these bookbinders refused to append Wither's hymns to the Psalter when they bound the books. Wither decided to try to get back at the Stationers Company by publishing an unlicensed and unpatented volume called The Scholar's Purgatory Discovered in the Stationer's Commonwealth. He was arrested and imprisoned for this. In the end, Wither retained the rights to his collection, but the Stationer's Company retained exclusive rights to publishing congregational song in England. This was not the only legal action involving the Stationer's Company. This legal action and other proceedings against Cambridge University led to an understanding that only metrical psalms were legally allowed to be sung in Church of England services. It was not until the early 19th century that this understanding was resolved. In case you're wondering, this is not just a 17th century as most of you know, copyright laws exist today, and yes, they apply to churches. All the music that we do in church has to either be in the public domain or we have to have a license in order to use it, both to reprint music in our bulletins and also for our live stream service. Only one of Wither's hymn texts made it into the hymnal 1982. It's hymn number 430. Come, O oh come, our voices raise. examples of poems that were eventually set to music include George Herbert's text that's used at hymn number 382, King of Glory, King of Peace. The tune that the text is paired with was written by David Charles Walker in the mid-1970s. Unfortunately, this beautiful tune is an example of a tune I can't play for a Music Monday because it's not covered by our license. The license only covers services here in the church. So you'll have to just keep your eyes out for this one and hear it another time. Another text by George Herbert, Let All the World in Every Corner Sing, can be found at hymns 402 and 403. However, I can't play those either because they are under copyright. Now, one hymn I can play for you with a George Herbert text is hymn 487. This is paired with a tune by Rafe Von Williams, which is in the public domain. The text is Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. Samuel Crossman is another hymn text writer from this time period. His beautiful hymn, which is number 458, 
My song is love unknown is another one of my favorite hymns for both the text and the tune. Unfortunately, John Ireland's beautiful hymn tune is still under copyright. And personally, I look forward to 2037 when it becomes public domain. Thomas Ken, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, was a notable exception. His poetry was originally conceived as congregational hymns rather than being adapted later on. While he was serving as Bishop's Chaplain at Winchester College, he published a booklet called A Manual of Prayers for Use of the Scholars of Winchester College in 1694. The introduction to this booklet included the directives. Be sure to sing the morning and evening hymn in your chamber devoutly, remembering that the psalmist, upon happy experience, assures you that it is a good thing to tell of the loving kindness of the Lord early in the morning and of his truth in the night season. The morning hymn that Ken spoke about is hymn number 11, Awake My Soul and With the Sun. And the evening hymn is Glory to Thee, My God, This Night, set to a tune by Thomas Tallis. Once again, I find myself talking about morning and evening prayer and the offices, so I'm going to plug my class on Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock on Zoom. Check your email for the link. I'll end this week's video by playing an organ setting of the Veni Creator chant that I mentioned earlier. Of course, I mentioned that it was used in ordination services and is still today. It's also associated with coronation services. In England, a metrical version of this hymn is sung just before the anointing of the new monarch. In France, it was sung as the king enters Rheims Cathedral. That's R-E-I-M-S, Rheims. And the verses that I will play are by Nicolas de Grigny. He was the organist at the Church of Saint-Denis in Paris. It was an abbey church and his brother was the sub-prior of the abbey. Later in life, he took over from his father as the organist at the Cathedral of Notre-Dame de Rheims. This cathedral is historically significant because it is the traditional location of the coronations of the kings of France, like Westminster Abbey for England. The melody and an English translation of this chant can be found at hymn number 504 in the hymnal 1982. I hope you enjoy this piece and I hope you've enjoyed this video and we'll see you soon.
uh-oh, you're evaluating my work. I am. Are you subscribed? I will with a red button. And give us a thumbs up. I'm a fan, of course.